search the world But it couldn't fill me Man's empty praise And treasures that fade And never enough But you came along And put me back together Every desire and now satisfied here in your love. Oh, there's nothing better than you. There's nothing better than you, Lord. There's nothing.
Thank you. Welcome to Wesley United Methodist Church, those who are worshiping either online or radio. And if you're here in person, here's a card to help deepen your connection with Christ and with us. There are also prayer cards in front of you. There also is a, an insert in your bulletin today. If you'd like to support our Wesley Daycare, it's time to order some pizzas. And those order forms can be placed in the atrium today. We continue today with Paul's Corinthian letter and a conversation on the impact of Christ's resurrection and our own. Pastor Melly, good morning. And I'm Pastor Scott, and we're glad you're here. Wesley, praise band, thank you. Lead us in worship. Our pleasure. Yes. Uh, before we have you stand and join us for our next song, I have an announcement to make. And since Randy doesn't have a mic back there, I will make it. But the flowers you see on the altar today are in honor of Randy's 29th wedding anniversary. So look at that. Points for Randy. Good job, Randy. <laughs> Please stand and join us for Build My Life.
are you today? like to go to school? Yes, I won't tell you that answer. <laughs> okay, well today I brought with me and you know who this is? Batman. Superman. We have Robin, the Hulk. Okay, I don't really. Green Lantern. It's the Green. I don't know what he does, but they're all superheroes, right? They're all superheroes, and they're fun to play with. And these are these are Jace's and my other grandson. Play, you have the bad guys too, right? Who always wins? The good guys or the bad guys? Good guys always win because they have these superpowers, right? Okay. But it's only make believe, right? They're not real. See one? You can see them. So they're not real. But do you know that in real life we have a superhero? Do you know who are superheroes? Jesus is our superhero because all of these guys, well, first of all, they're make-believe, but even in the make-believe world, their powers are limited. They're limited on what they can do, but Jesus has no limit. He is our savior. These guys in, in the clay world protect us from the world, or from, save us from the evils in the world, but Jesus does that every single day. And he... He died on the cross to save us. So there's a couple things I want you to remember. First of all, the Bible says, if God is with us, who can be against us? So we don't really need superheroes. We have Jesus, right? And then if he's with us, nobody else can be with us. And he's far more powerful than Superman. He's bigger than all of the supervillains that we might have. So fear, if we're ever afraid, or if we have temptation, he's bigger than those. So we just have to turn to him. So remember that the Lord is the one who will fight for you, always. And he will surely be the one to avenge you from those who are evil. So I want you to remember these things, and I'm going to read this so I get it straight. So Jesus is our only Savior. Jesus is our only Savior. The Lord protects us always, and the Lord is our, revenger, our avenger. So let's be thankful for these truths. Can you pray with me? Heavenly Father, thank you for being our one protector, one who can guide us through everything, anytime we're good, things going bad in our lives. We know that you are with us and you are our true superhero. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Good morning. God is good all the time. This is the time for us to come together in prayer, and I invite you for Monday's prayer from 4 to 6 p.m. here in the sanctuary. I have one, one prayer request here. It's for Milo Murphy. It's uh, Caroline Gross' uh, cousin. He's an infant. He was born three months premature, so we need to lift uh, little Milo in God's hands, and the parents as well. You also have prayer requests listed on our prayer, on our bulletin, so I hope you remember to pray for those ones as well. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we give you praise. We thank you, Lord, for allowing us to come together this morning to worship you. We thank you, Lord, for the many blessings that you have given us. We praise your name and lift your name high and asking that you accept our act of worship this morning, Lord. So I pray that your spirit will move upon each one of us gathered here and those worshiping with us 
away from here. I ask that your spirit will minister according to the need in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Lord, for who you are. Thank you, omnipotent, omniscient, omnipresent God. I leave this congregation in your hands, Lord. Look upon us and bless us abundantly and help us to be in ministry with you and serve one another in the name of Jesus. Lord, I pray for those who are not feeling well, those who have made up this morning to come and worship you. I ask that you touch them with your healing hands and heal them, Lord. And those in hospital, in homes, wherever they are, Lord, I ask for your grace of healing as well as we remember little baby Milo. And Lord, we lift this little one that you have blessed in your hand and asking that you be with him. Just bless the little baby, Lord. Help him to be well, be with the parents, strengthen them, Lord, in the name of Jesus. So I pray, Lord, for many others who have lost loved ones. I ask that you comfort them. I pray for those traveling at this time that, Lord, you'll be with them till they reach their destination. Lord, I thank you for your word that you have made available for us and praying that you continue speaking to us and helping us understand your will, your ways. And I pray also for the unrest in the many nations. I pray for your people, for your children who have gone forward, teaching your words. I ask that you be their light in the name of Jesus, for you are the light. Lord, I thank you for you love us, and you are always with us, and you continue being with us. So I pray that you hear the prayers of us as we lift our voices, saying the way your son Jesus Christ continues to teach us, our Father, who art in heaven. Our Lord be thy name, thy kingdom, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Now I'll invite the ashes to please come forward as we pray for the offering. God of grace, God of love, we thank you, Lord, for the time of sharing. Now I ask that you bless what we are about to give and bless the source of providence, Lord. Multiply it for your work in the name of Jesus. I give you praise and glory. Amen.
Old Testament is coming to us from Psalm 98, verse 1 to 8, 8 to 9. Oh, sing to the Lord a new song, for he has done marvelous things. His right hand and his holy arm have gotten him victory. The Lord has made known his victory. He has revealed his vindication in the sight of the nations. He has remembered his steadfast love and faithfulness to the house of Israel. All the ends of the earth have seen the victory of our God. Make a joyful noise to the Lord all the earth. Break forth into joyous song and sing praises. Sing praises to the Lord with the lyre, with the lyre and the sound of melody, with trumpet and the sound of the horn. Make a joyful noise before the King, the Lord. Let the sea roar and all that fills in it, the world and those who live in it. Let the floods clap. Let the floods clap their hands. Let the hills sing together for joy at the presence of the Lord, for He is coming to judge the earth. He will judge the world with righteousness and the peoples with equity. Our New Testament reading is taken from, again, Paul's first letter to the Corinthians, chapter 15. And we pick up in verse 35, selected verses today. Will you stand for the reading of the New Testament? But someone will ask, how are the dead raised? With what kind of body do they come? Fool, what you sow does not come to life unless it dies. And as for what you sow, you do not sow the body that is to be, but a bare seed, perhaps of wheat or some other grain. But God gives it a body as he has chosen in each kind of seed its own body. In verse 42, so it is with the resurrection of the dead. What is sown is perishable. What is raised is imperishable. It is sown in dishonor, it is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness, it is raised in power. It is sown a physical body, it is raised a spiritual body. If there is a physical body, there is also a spiritual body. Verse 50, what I'm saying, brothers and sisters, is this, flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the Perishable inherit the imperishable. Listen, I will tell you a mystery. We will not all die. We will be changed in a moment. In the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet, the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised imperishable. and We will be changed. For this perishable body must put on imperishability. This mortal body must put on immortality. When this perishable body puts on imperishability, and this mortal body puts on immortality, then the saying that is written will be fulfilled. Death has been swallowed up in victory. Where, O death, is your victory? Where, O death, is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. This is the word of God for the people of God. Speed to God. You may be seated. Savior God, interpret your message for our minds and hearts. Shape our souls by your grace in this life and the next. Through Jesus Christ, amen. Our children may have small minds, but they have a vast, remarkable capacity to imagine, 
to wonder about life and the world beyond as well. What do they see behind the curtain of eternity? How do they view heaven? Well, an eight-year-old boy says, heaven is a place where there's a lot of money lying around. You could just pick it up and play with it and buy things. A small girl says, heaven is up in the sky. You could look down at circuses for free if you want to, except you have to ask God for permission first. Another says, I know what heaven is, but I don't want to go there. I want to go to North Carolina. This week, I asked some of our Wesley daycare kids, what is heaven? Here are some things they said. Lily passed away, and I miss her. Heaven will be fun. Dad told me there's a playground there. I asked them, where is heaven? One of them said, you could drive there. Another said, it's up past the moon. Another said, it's, it's under God and up to God. So I asked them a deeply theological question. How do you get to heaven? And one boy jumped up and said, you have to die. I asked Angela, our two-year-old granddaughter, where is heaven? I'm not sure she fully comprehended, but she said it's where Mimi is, her other grandmother. And she said, they go to school in heaven, they learn their letters and sing twinkle, twinkle. Our grandson, six, he said, heaven means you're safe. You're going to die when you go to heaven or when you're 100. And be careful, those of you who are close, right? It's up in the sky. You just float there. If you believe in him, Jesus does that. End of quote. Children wonder about death. They wonder about heaven. They wonder about eternal life. The more time you spend with them, the more you learn not to underestimate the capacity of their minds. Adults also struggle with their feelings about death. Is there a more difficult subject? What does God's future look like? What, what about spring when we celebrate the resurrection? What about our own resurrection? What does that look like? Paul started the conversation a couple weeks ago with us. He painted some portraits for the church at Corinth. They were confused about Jesus' life. They were vague about understanding the meaning of his death. They had their doubts about resurrection. His resurrection. So Paul reminded them of the basics. Christ came, he died, he rose, he was seen by hundreds. And that Paul says one day we too will have resurrected lives. He gives us a glimpse behind the curtain. Verse 50, he says, What I'm saying, brothers and sisters, is this flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. Listen, I will tell you a mystery. I remember reading my first mystery novel, Secret of, Secret of Picture Rocks Canyon by Betty Swinford. I was a young boy. A compelling adventures it told about a little boy, his horse, and a Native American shepherd. Paul deals with his own profound mysteries. He's reflecting on the meaning of Jesus' life, Jesus' death, his resurrection, and our own, a mystery yet to be solved. How do you describe a place you've never been? How do you experience or talk about an experience you've never had? How do you demonstrate the resurrection when nothing prepares you to comprehend it? You wait, you wonder, and you welcome it. That's what retired Bishop Will Willimon says, 
You wait for it with openness. You wonder about it with awesomeness. And you welcome it with grace. The bishop said, resurrection is something God gives you. We do not understand it. We stand under it. John Henry Jowett was an influential British pastor in the late 20th century. He invited us to think about death, the death of a, of a Christian, not like midnight, but like dawn. The veil has not yet been lifted. Or he said it's like a house where the shades are drawn, the doors closed, but a, a comforting, clear, cheering, bright glow is emanating from the house. The Lord is radiating his presence. Our own resurrection is a mystery still to be solved. And the promise that our bodies will be transformed. Paul tries to talk about it in verse 42. So it is with the resurrection of the dead. What is sown is perishable, what is raised is imperishable. It is sown in dishonor, it is raised in glory. It is sown in in weakness, it is raised in power. It is sown a physical body. It is raised a spiritual body. If there's a physical body, he says, there's also a spiritual body. Paul's talking about our lives today and the transformation of our spiritual bodies in death. I know some of us get really stuck trying very hard to get these bodies in shape transform these bodies somehow with health and exercise. The best advice I've seen recently is to make sure your TV set and refrigerator are far apart. If they weren't, some of us wouldn't get any exercise at all. And the trouble with jogging is that by the time you realize you're not in shape for it, it's too far to walk back home. And then this week I read that... Uh, Someone suggested if you're going to take up cross-country skiing, start with a very small country. The Apostle Paul was dealing with the transformation of a different body. He wrote to Christians who wondered, like we do, about what our resurrection looks like. What does it mean for your own death? How are you transformed in resurrection? How do you trust Christ while facing death? Is there fear or comfort in your mind? Where's the assurance you need? How, how and what should you expect? Are you anxious to ponder what's ahead? And so 20 years before the gospels circulated, Paul wrote the Corinthian letters where he provides the first record of Jesus' life, death, resurrection, and he talks about a promise of our own resurrection. He does talk about the importance of these bodies, this earthly journey in the letters of Corinth. He spoke with assurance, hope, promise, expectation. With a broad brush, he illustrates our resurrection to be something like Sleeping in grace, like awakening to a trumpet, like a seed buried in the soil, kind of like a, a grain of corn buried then surfacing as a plant. So he's saying that the body of flesh dies so the eternal self can emerge. He is saying that this body and how you live in this body matters. It's your first gift from God, right? In 1 Thessalonians 5.23, Paul prays that your spirit, soul, and body would be kept whole. He's also saying that you will emerge with a different body in resurrection because these bodies are perishable, he says. That is, vulnerable, susceptible to virus, disease, and time, 
I haven't figured out how to manage that time. Of course, I'm the wrong kind of doctor to explain what happens with your body, but any physician can confirm with you, you've got limits. Paul struggles with a, a bit of awkwardness, but he stirs our imagination to say God will form a new body for us. It reminds us that by faith we are bound in Christ. He promises that in death we are the same, that is the same person, a new body, a new dimension, a new form. He says, flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. Frederick Buechner in his book, Wishful Thinking, talks about the phrase we use in some of our creeds, resurrection of the body. He suggests it's an affirmation that God prizes us enough to bring us back, not as a disembodied echo of, of a human, but as a new and revised version of ourselves, of all that makes us unique. Our own resurrection is a mystery still to be solved. And it's the promise that our bodies will be transformed. And it's the hope for a victory that is yet to be achieved. He writes, the perishable puts on imperishability, the mortal put on, puts on immortality. Then the saying that is written will be fulfilled. Death has been swallowed up in victory. Oh, death, where is your victory, O oh, death? Where is your sting? The sting of death is sin. The power of sin is the law, but thanks be to God who gives us victory through Jesus Christ. Paul's pulling back the curtain to give us a glimpse. It's the same curtain that Isaiah speaks of in his 25th chapter when he writes, On Mount Zion, the Lord of hosts will make for all peoples a feast of rich food, a feast of well-aged wines, and he will destroy on this mountain the shroud that is cast over all the peoples, the sheet that is spread over all the nations. He will swallow up death forever. I think that's what we try to do every Sunday here at Wesley United Methodist Church. Each Sabbath, like a mini Easter, a miniature Easter. Each worship with the Lord, a celebration of a new day, a new birth, a new life, a sampling of the resurrection, our own resurrection when Christ completes his work in us. Charles Wesley in 1739 described that eternal victory with these words. We'll sing them again not too long. Love's redeeming work is done. Alleluia. Fought the fight. The battle's won. Alleluia. Death in vain forbids his rise. Christ has opened paradise. Alleluia. Soar we now where Christ has led, following our exalted head, made like him, like him we rise. Ours, the cross, the grave, the skies. Alleluia. Each time we gather, may our glimpse through the curtain of resurrection keep us faithful, hopeful, joyful, committed to victory in Jesus Christ. So let's join together, let's stand as Pastor Melly leads us in an affirmation of faith, number 883. We are not alone. We live in God's world. We believe in God who created and is creating, who has come in Jesus 
the word made flesh to reconcile and make new, who works in us and others by the Spirit. We trust in God. We are called to be the church, to celebrate God's presence, to love and serve others, to seek justice and resist evil, to proclaim Jesus crucified and risen, our judge and our hope in life, in death, in the life beyond death, God is with us. We are not alone. Thanks be to God. Amen. Please remain standing for the closing hymn. my mind to Calvary where Jesus bled and died for me I see his wounds his hands his feet my Savior on that curse body bound and drenched in tears they laid him down in Joseph's tomb the entrance sealed by heavy stone Messiah
offer this benediction. God grace our life journey that we not devalue the meaning of these bodies on this journey and the way we live and keep us hopeful, trusting in you for that which is to come. In the name of the Father and Son and Holy Spirit, amen. This is a 